Hey, another incredible story happened to me recently. Yeah, I'm just a lucky guy, I guess. It was Saturday, and my grandpa asked me to help him clean the garage. I thought it would be a pretty dull day. If only I knew what was coming for me. I was sorting boxes and came across a calculator. I wanted to check if it was still working, so I gave it new batteries, pressed on, and everything disappeared. It was so dark that I couldn't see anything around me. I had a slight feeling of being pushed somewhere. A moment later, I could see again. I wasn't in the garage anymore, but standing in the middle of a narrow street. What had happened? How had it happened? It couldn't have been the old calculator, but what else was there to blame? Was it even a calculator? Walking around me were people dressed in kilt-like skirts and sandals. I looked around and far away, I spotted a pyramid. Was it a pyramid of Giza? Did that mean I was in Egypt? Wow! It seemed like the calculator was some sort of teleportation machine. But then another thought struck me. What if there was only one pyramid? There should have been three. The first one was built by Pharaoh Khufu in 2550 BC. The second one, with the Sphinx Monument, was built 30 years later by his son, Pharaoh Khafre. The third one, the smallest, was built 30 years after that by Pharaoh Menkere. But here, I could clearly see there was only one pyramid. This meant that the calculator didn't just teleport me through space, but through time, too. It was a time machine, and I was somewhere around 2550 BC when only one of Giza's great pyramids had been built. So, I was in ancient Egypt. It was hard to believe, but it was pointless to try to deny because I could see it with my own eyes. I even pinched myself, but it wasn't a dream. It seemed like nobody could see me. I walked down the street, and it felt fantastic to be here. Did you know the Egyptians were likely the first people to calculate that a day lasts 24 hours and created a 365-day calendar? They combined mathematics and astronomy to figure this out around 4000 BC. Originally, the 12 months of their solar calendar each had 30 days, but later they added several extra days. Around me, the surroundings started to fade, and then I was in the darkness again. When I could finally see once more, I found myself in the middle of a street again, but this time it was totally different. It was easy to tell I was in the future. Green areas were on the roof of every building. Cows were grazing up there. Trees and greenery stretched between roads. To use the space better, there were roads above me too, on many levels connecting everything together. As I was gazing around, trying to find a flying car, Someone called out to me. Hey, hello! A young man was staring right at me. You look really weird. Where do you come from? Um, America? I don't think they still wear that clothing there. I mean, what time do you come from? You're a time traveler, right? I was surprised. Was time traveling so typical here? I said I was from 2020 and got a, wow, you're really old, in return. Sweet. We walked for a while, and here's what I learned from the guy. First, he could see me when no one else in the past could, because the past was historically preserved, and we couldn't be participants, so we wouldn't change anything. Turned out, I was in Indonesia in the year 2176. To my surprise, the guy was 45 years old, but he didn't look a year over 25. On average, people now lived 120 years and were aging way slower due to progressive health improvements in technology. Underwater, there was a whole system of high-speed train lines. People could travel from Indonesia to North America in just one hour. An average 22nd century citizen had been everywhere on the planet, but tourism still existed. Only it was space tourism. People were taking trips to Mars, the Moon, and to a couple of space stations. A billion people lived on Mars already. Still, Earth's population was continually growing, and people were now moving underwater. There were already three big cities down there, and another one was under construction. I had so many questions, but suddenly, I was gone again. That darkness and the feeling of being pushed had returned. This time, the first thing I felt was cold. 
When I could see again, it was dark around me, and I was in water. I only had a maximum of one hour before my body temperature dropped and hypothermia would set in. I was hoping this trip wouldn't take me long, and the time machine would drag me somewhere else in a few minutes. Still, I couldn't take any chances. I had to figure out how to get out of the water. I looked around for any nearby land, but it was hard to see. Then, I noticed the lights. Several hundred feet away, a huge ship was approaching. Hopefully, I was in the future again. That way, I'd be visible to the people on board and had a chance to be saved. But then, I noticed something that destroyed all my hopes. The ship was heading for a dark object in the water, an iceberg. The ship was the Titanic. I knew exactly where I was. The Atlantic Ocean, April 14, 1912, at about 11.40 p.m. I was about to witness the sinking of the Titanic. My heart skipped a beat, and I even forgot I was in the water as I stared at the ship quickly approaching the iceberg. I wanted to do something to change history, but I couldn't do anything. One, two, three. On the count of 37, I heard a cracking sound. The impact. History was about to happen. The ship kept moving forward, but I knew it wouldn't reach its destination. Everything around me went blurry. With a heavy heart, I was traveling to a new place. I ended up on land once more. It was midday and it was hot, which was pretty fortunate because I was cold and wet. I was somewhere that looked like a tropical forest. But there were no clues as to what age I was in, or even which continent. I decided to explore and headed out. Pretty soon, I had an answer when I came across a dinosaur. It was the height of me, but about 20 feet long. A Dilophosaurus. Thankfully, it couldn't see me. I didn't feel safe and wanted to run away and hide, but I stayed because, even in 2020, you didn't meet a dinosaur every day. I tried to follow him, but he was too fast for me to keep up. But the good news was, I now knew where I'd ended up. Dilophosaurus lived in the early Jurassic period, around 193 million years ago. Specifically, I was in North America, but it wasn't where you might imagine it to be. At that time, our world looked different. Instead of seven continents on Earth, there was only one. The supercontinent Pangaea stretched from pole to pole. So, I was standing in North America. Eurasia was up in the Northeast. Beneath North America was South America. To the right of that was Africa. Beneath that, there was Antarctica, Australia, and India. Yep, India was that far away from Eurasia before it traveled to where it would be in 2020. Imagine, if the continents hadn't drifted apart, India would be a pretty cold country. So, I was on Pangaea. But the process of the continents breaking apart had already started. North America was shifting away from the rest of the continent, moving one inch a year. Still, it would take millions of years more to drift where it was in 2020. And even back in the 21st century, it was always moving. I kept wandering the forest, and I should admit, it was pretty creepy. It was filled with many odd animals, like massive flying insects, lizards 4 feet long, and all different kinds of dinosaurs. I couldn't remember the names of them all. I was studying a bizarre creature when one of the giant insects flew right through my head. Everything went dark, and I was gone again. I opened my eyes and found myself in the garage. The calculator's battery depleted. My grandpa walked in and asked how it was going. I showed him the calculator and asked what it was. A calculator, he replied. That's it? Just a calculator? It doesn't take you to places? That's it. It just calculates. But I knew my trips happened for real. And I suspected my grandpa knew the calculator's secret, too. The largest sandcastle in the world is located in Denmark. It's over 69 feet tall. 30 sand sculptors who created it used more than 5,000 tons of sand. To make it more durable, they added 10% of clay, together with a layer of glue. 
They built it to stand tall against long and stormy winters. You can actually spend the night inside a giant potato. The next time you want to get a proper rest in a pretty unique way, you can book a bed inside a 28-foot long, 12-foot wide potato. Well, at least in this cool structure made of concrete, steel, and plaster, that kind of looks like a potato. Teenagers from other decades look different from high schoolers you see today. At first sight, they seem way older, don't they? But it's just because they have a different style. They grew up and kept buying similar clothes they thought looked cool. Now we associate that same style with people that are 50 or 60 years old. So now when we see those pictures from their teenage days, it only feels like they look older. In reality, they just look like the teenagers of today. The same thing will happen with today's teens. They'll keep buying clothes they think look cool when they get older too. That's why future generations will associate their dressing style with old people. Jaguar, Black Cayman, Sloth, Giant Armadillo. There are many different animals you can find in the Amazon rainforest. But was that right there? Rewind a bit. Yep, right in its center, you can find a humpback whale. It's rare to see one even in the middle of the ocean. And it's really jaw-dropping to find one in the middle of the Amazon. And that's what happened in 2019 when local people found a lifeless humpback. The animal probably washed into the river mouth of the Amazon and ended on land when tides pulled back. Elephants have enormous ears, and normally they hold them out to scan noise back and forth. But there are sometimes distant vocalizations and noise they can hear with their feet. When they detect something that's far away, elephants freeze and lean forward. They transfer weight to their front legs and may even lift up a front foot. People often think apple pie originally came from America, but nope. Apples are actually native to Asia, and the first recorded recipe for apple pie appeared in England. When a material fades in the sun, where do you think the color goes? A certain material gets the color from the regions of molecules called chromophores. They absorb photons at particular wavelengths. Photon is the basic unit of light. Some photons that don't get absorbed are re-emitted, and their wavelength determines the color we see. When you expose a material to sunlight, or photons of higher energy, it can damage its chromophores, which is why they won't be able to emit photons at certain wavelengths. Red materials fade in sunlight the most. Their chromophores emit red light in a way that they mop up photons of the rest of the wavelengths. You're preparing a meal, cutting the vegetables, and… Oh no! Here come the tears! We cry when we cut onions because breaking the skin releases enzymes and sulfenic acid. When they combine, they produce a gas that spreads through the air and irritates our eyes. This prompts the tear glands that start producing tears to flush this irritating acid out. Your brain can't perform two things that ask for high-level brain function at the same time. Yep, you can't really multitask. We can't consider low-level functions such as pumping blood and breathing in multitasking. Only those actions you really have to think through. So what you see as multitasking is rapidly switching between two or more tasks. Try to move your feet and hands in the opposite direction. Sit on a chair and turn your left leg clockwise. Draw an 8 shape with your left hand at the same time. Or do the same with the right hand and leg. It seems like your leg changed its direction, right? It's what happens with almost everybody. If you turn your leg counterclockwise, the same will happen. When you get on a roundabout that's spinning really fast, you can feel that strange force, and it seems like it wants to throw you off. Our planet is like a huge roundabout that's spinning in space at approximately 1,000 miles per hour. But we don't feel that spinning force because there's another force acting on our planet and on us. Gravity. It holds us firmly to the ground around 1,000 times more strongly than our planet is spinning and trying to catapult us into space. 
The toothpaste contains sweeteners because it has detergents that create foam when you brush your teeth, and it needs something that will mask the awful soapy taste they bring. Of course, sugar is out. But there are other sweeteners that do a nice job with covering detergents. These sweetener chemicals attract water. They keep water molecules locked in the toothpaste so it doesn't dry out. Have you ever noticed how you're often less hungry when it's hot outside? All the metabolic processes that are happening in our body, including digestion, produce heat. For every 1,000 calories you eat, your body converts only 250 into energy that's actually useful. The rest of the calories turn into waste heat. When it's hot outside, your body is working pretty hard to keep you safe from overheating. So it doesn't really need the extra heat it generates digesting a big lunch you had. That's why your body kind of dials back your appetite for a while and pulls more energy from the fat reserves it previously stored. Sometimes dreams can seem more vivid when you don't sleep in your own bed. When you spend the night in a hotel or some other place you're not quite familiar with, you experience something scientists call the first night effect. In one of the studies, they discovered the left side of our brain sleeps lighter than the right side during the first night in a new environment. It's probably like this because of an evolutionary mechanism that keeps us alert to potential predators and dangers. There are probably no monsters under the bed in your hotel room, but you wouldn't be so sure if you had lived thousands of years ago. You're also more likely to wake up during your first night in new surroundings. When you wake up a lot, you remember your dreams way better, which is why they can feel more vivid in such situations. You're at work, you just had lunch, and now you're getting ready to finish the final task for the day. But you just can't. You got such an energy crash you want to lie down and take a nap to feel alive again. This can be because of a carb-heavy meal, not getting enough sleep the night before, or not drinking enough water. And there's one more possible reason. There's a small region in your brain that controls your internal body clock, also called circadian rhythm. This part sends signals to your body to release melatonin, a snooze-inducing hormone. This way, it makes you feel sleepy and lowers your body temperature too. You go through a miniature version of this process somewhere between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. too. We still don't know why, but some researchers think it could be because our circadian rhythm has both a primary 24-hour cycle and a 12-hour one. You may feel like the best ideas come to your mind when you're trying to fall asleep. The transition from the point where you're awake to where you're asleep is called the hypnagogic state. Scientists believe it could be related to creativity. Mary Shelley said that the idea for her popular novel, Frankenstein, occurred during the waking dream stage. Salvador Dali, a famous artist, called this phase the slumber with a key. In this state, your mind feels free to wander and has no mobile phones, other people, or something else that can disrupt it. That's why it has more space for some spontaneous ideas and creative thoughts. If you fall asleep right after you enter this state, you'll probably forget most of your inspirational ideas. So, keep a paper and pen by your bed, just in case. 98 degrees Fahrenheit is a temperature that feels hot, even though the human body is of the same temperature. Well, actually, this is about the average temperature of our core. Our skin is about 93 degrees Fahrenheit, but our fingers, toes, and face can be much colder. The receptors we have in our skin react to differences and changes in temperature. When you touch your bare stomach with your hand, the hand will register warmth, but it will be cooler for your stomach, even though both of them have skin temperature. Similar to that, if you put a finger in your mouth, the inside will feel way warmer to the finger than to your tongue. I bet you've got an antiseptic or a pack of antibacterial wet wipes in your bag. Once the germ theory got known to the public, people started being quite careful about hygiene. But back in the day, no one knew anything about germs, and the physicians back then strongly believed it was poisoned air that people needed to be careful about. Therefore, a special outfit was invented. 
The doctors believed that the beak protected them from bad air. Plus, there was another theory on how to protect oneself from germs. People would carry various incense, as their sweet smell was believed to help protect from bad air, too. Also, bouquets of flowers were quite popular. Many doctors were sure that holding a posy of flowers to the nose kept away all bad health conditions. I guess they'd say back then, a flower a day keeps the doctor away, huh? Another fun fact about those outfits the doctors in Europe wore is that they're in use even today. Nope, it's not that there's a thematic hospital with weirdly looking doctors, but it's actually a traditional carnival costume in Venice, Italy. By the way, bouquets of flowers weren't the only nice smelling trends in history. In ancient Egypt, people would wear wax or perfume cones right on their heads. Rumor has it, it was a sort of ancient deodorant, as those cones were probably aimed at concealing body odor. The cones were typically placed on top of wigs, and as the cones melted under the hot Egyptian sun, they would release a sweet smell. About five millenniums ago, people in Egypt, Greece, and other ancient countries would fray a small twig to clean in between their teeth. Some scientists say that these twigs had the other end sharpened, and people used it as a toothpick. Also, to keep their breath fresh, the Egyptians used makeshift mints. For instance, some of them would chew parsley or some other herbs after meals, and sometimes during the day. Plus, they made mints of herbs and spices and used cinnamon, pine seeds, and frankincense. To sort of glue all the ingredients together, they usually used honey. In the end, they shaped them as candies with the help of fire. Cleopatra had her trademark eye makeup look, and in fact, Egyptians were the first people to invent mascara. They'd mix honey, soot, water, and crocodile dung. Ugh. They'd apply this crazy mix right onto their lashes and brows. It probably didn't have a sweet scent, but at least it was safe, unlike the toxic eyeliner they invented that contained lead. In the ancient world, Clothes had no variety of colors. They were mostly white. But if someone really wanted to rock a colorful outfit, they needed to prepare it for dyeing using insects. It's not a thing of the past, though. Every time you grab a couple of sugar-coated candies, remember there's some carmine made from beetles lurking behind that cheerful color. Same goes for bright lipsticks, too. Going back to weird ancient fashion, not only the people back then had weirdly shaped masks, but they also had weirdly shaped clothes. I'm talking about bleos. Those were the dresses with extreme sleeves. They were usually floor length, and obviously, those who wore them were totally helpless. They couldn't perform even the simplest tasks, but there was some thought behind it. Those sleeves symbolized that the person was rich enough to afford those inactive hands and that there was someone to help them do all the necessary things. Leo dresses were trendy between the 11th and 13th centuries. Now, look here. These shoes with super pointy and extremely long tips were one of the hottest trends in 15th century Europe. They were called Krakows because the design originated in the town of Krakow, Poland. There wasn't really any sense or purpose of these shoes. Reportedly, it was all about fashion. Come on, don't be surprised. Super long and pointy shoes were trendy even in the 90s and aughts. Historians believe that Krakows weren't quite comfortable. The toes were supposed to be stuffed. Otherwise, they would have had zero rigidity and shape. There are some surviving examples of those shoes. One in London reveals there was moss in the toes. Also, according to an Italian chronicler, these type of shoes were often stuffed with horse hair. Apparently, the shoes weren't quite practical and quickly fell out of style. Are you into bright and vivid colors? People throughout history have shown much admiration for vibrant colors, so it's no wonder they wanted to make their outfits as bright as possible. In most cases, it was really expensive, but sometimes it was both expensive and super dangerous. Like in Victorian era England, people loved a bottle green color and many women wanted to have a bottle green dress. To achieve that shade, though, people used arsenic. Yikes! However, 
Those fancy dresses were mainly worn on special occasions, so women weren't often in constant contact with arsenic. Still, even limited exposure could provoke undesired consequences. For a perfect look, it was cool to dye one's hair chestnut brown, the trendiest color of that era. Sulfuric acid worked wonders and could turn even the blackest hair lighter, but it was super toxic. Mercury was used for clothing too. Hats were made of fur, and hat makers would use this toxic metal to stick that fur together so that it formed felt. People who wore them inhaled toxic gases produced by such hats, and the consequences were unpredictable because it affected the central nervous system. This one is not a type of pasta, but another fashion trend of the past that didn't make it through until now, unlike yummy pasta. If you ever want to try macaroni style, make sure you live in the mid-18th century, have an enormously exaggerated Empire State Building high wig adorned with a teeny tiny hat and don't forget a feather on top, wear bright stockings, preferably striped, wear pants, the tighter the better, ideally they should be just like leggings. But remember, there was no lycra back then. To polish things up, add a walking cane and sophisticated manners. Almost forgot, get ready to be mocked about your exquisite style for the next few decades or even centuries. Tudor England had some fashion trends people wouldn't ever understand. Today, some people shell out thousands of dollars to make their smiles impeccably white and shiny. But back in Tudor England times, women would blacken their teeth on purpose to seem wealthy. Sugar was pricey and hard to find, and very few people could afford it. It was widely believed that the more sugar you ate, the blacker your teeth got, which was an obvious sign of wealth. Historians believe honey was sometimes used as a toothpaste. If you think black teeth alone aren't enough to feel like a true tutor, try rocking bombast. But you'll probably feel more like a teddy bear, not like the Queen of England. Back in the 16th century, both men and women would use all sorts of things to stuff their sleeves. It could be cotton, wool, sawdust, socks. They did their best to accentuate their arms to make them look strong and sporty. The more sleeve stuffing you've got, the stronger you seem. Some men would stuff the area around their calves and even bellies to look more muscular. Now add a ruffle around your neck, supported by a metal corset to preserve impeccable shape, and voila, you're a true tutor. In the 19th century United States, arsenic was mainly used for cosmetic purposes. Manufacturers would add it to wafers, promising that their product would help get rid of any facial imperfections. The amount of arsenic added did help clear the skin and make it paler, but veggies and fruits sound like a nicer option today. Radioactive cream didn't sound wild at all at the beginning of the 20th century. This radium-rich product was supposed to wipe away all your wrinkles and make anyone who used it at least 20 years younger. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.